We started in 1994 um, as Precision Compacted Components or PCC. Um, and APG took over in 2016 um, with those locations that I mentioned earlier. So what we do is we produce powdered metal parts um, for a wide variety of different applications. So a little bit of background about myself. Um, I graduated from Johnsonburg in 2012, um, went to Robert Morris University and graduated from there in 2016. I double majored in mechanical and biomedical engineering. And I've been with APG since 2018 as a product engineer. So just about four years now. And I'm Jeff Lachine, just like Bill, I graduated from Johnsburg High School, except I graduated in 2014. I took a little different route getting to this engineering position. I uh, went to a trade school right after high school. I went to Triangle Tech in Dubois, uh, where I got an associate's degree in maintenance, electricity, and construction technology. And then I started actually started working here at the plant in my senior year of high school in 2014 and started as a maintenance mechanic. Then after I graduated Triangle Tech, I moved on to be an electrician. And then from 2018 to now, I am the automation engineer at, the, at this facility. So I put a little video together, kind of explain what we do, kind of the stuff I get into and all that stuff. So we're powder metal. Factory. This is what we start with, powder metal, just like sand, different uh, components mixed in there. We throw this uh, powder into a die and a press will come down and compact it into a solid part as you see right here. So this, this press actually features built-in pickoffs and this part will go across the weight scale. As you can see right here, every part we do out of this machine gets weighed. And if it's good, it'll continue on to the conveyor. If not, it'll get kicked out. So this is that same press. It's actually our newest press that came all the way over from Italy. Multi-axis CNC, all hydraulic. It's the, the biggest and uh, newest press we have. Here's our second biggest press we have, uh, older style Cincinnati press. Uh, this is a 400 ton press, a little bit bigger. And then we also do smaller ones. Right here is a 30 ton. Uh, this press is probably only about eight foot tall, doing smaller little parts that you can see on the table, like inserts. We do a lot of them. And then here's the smallest press we have. This is a 15 ton. This, the top of this press is probably about a six and a half, seven foot, real small. So we can do small parts as well. So here, what I want to show you is when, when we uh, compact this powder, we call these green parts and they look solid, but as you can see, they break apart very easy. So what we end up doing is centering these parts. And right here is one of our furnaces. You can see uh, our high heat zone in there. It's over 2000 degrees. We send these parts through and it'll harden up the parts so they don't break as easy. And we can do other processing like sizing and machining. So let's get into these furnace loaders. All of our furnaces here at the facility are automatically loaded. Right here is one that gets fed from two presses into one furnace. There's a side A and a side B. Right here, a part comes down and this goes over another weigh scale, just like that first press. We are weighing all these parts to make sure they're within weight. And here's the other press, the other side, weighing this part as well. If they're good, they continue on to the system. If not, they get kicked out. As you can see, here is a press on that side, and here is this one. And as you can see, this one also has a robot, which we'll get into on the next video. So this guy has a robot picking a part right out of a die, and it actually takes the part to a laser mounted right on the side of the press. What this is doing is checking the overall length on our part. We want to make sure that these parts are within length for our customers. If you look closely, you can see that laser beam in there, which I think I... I zoom in a little bit more here, yep. So you'll see a laser on that part right there. Check seven points on this part. So here's a look inside that furnace loader. We have a magnetic gripper right there grabbing a part, puts it on a, on a carbon slate to be pushed onto the furnace. And 
like I said, this one does two presses. So we got two different parts. As you can see, the gantry will switch sides whenever there's a part in that nest. And these are all programmed by us, maintained by us uh, every day. Different patterns, we actually can program all the patterns. The part on the left over here that we actually double stack them with the ones on the right are only single stack. So there's a lot of versatility you can do with these things, which makes it a really nice universal system. So here is another one similar to the first one you guys just see, except this only has one press running into it. So what we do is we alternate sides. So we have slates on the left and right side, and this left side slate is about full after this part. It will then be sent right onto the furnace belt and the gantry will start loading the right side. We like to stagger them down the furnace belt so that you don't have all the weight on one side, you'll end up ripping your furnace belt right down the middle. You see, and here is the newest one that we just did. It probably got put it installed about three or four months ago, I'd say. Uh, I went a different approach for this. I went with a newer Fanuc Scare robot, which we'll see pretty soon. And we use the robot to load these parts directly onto the furnace belt instead of the slates. So here the parts are getting molded, coming down a conveying system all the way into my piece of automation to be picked up by a robot. And this one sets it right on the weigh scale, weighs this part just like the others. And if it's good, it will continue on to the furnace belt directly, or it will get thrown out the other side of the, the uh, robot system over there. And uh, like this one, you see the the blue mount on the end of the robot there, that's a 3D printed mount. I do a lot of 3D printing fixtures and robot end of arm tooling as made out of uh, high impact ABS. That's been on there for like I said, three or four months since robots crash many times and they hold up very good. Also on the nest and them conveyors and black pieces, them are also 3D printed. And then them white pieces that are holding the sensors, also 3D printing. So then our sizing presses, uh, our sizing presses are automated just like this. Here's a typical robot cell we have with the FANUC robot on it. Right there's a close to look at the robot. We'll put this right in front of our press. So then this robot will automatically load the sizing presses. There's a video of it right here. A camera is actually taking a picture above that part and it's telling the robot where to orient it. So the robot then, as you can see, it'll turn the part and put it on that fixture in the same place every time. That is the good thing about vision. And here's another sizing press. This one does a little bit different. This one loads right into the die and out of the die. So if you look at the bottom left, there's an orient table. A part will come down. See it spinning? There's a camera above this one too. But instead of using the robot to turn it, we use a, a table. Makes the process a little bit quicker and easier on the robot. So another type of robot we have are what they call collaborative robots. These are made from universal robots. And these ones are used for our vision system. We're checking the teeth on all these parts. As you can see with that camera flashing, they will reject it if the teeth are bad, but let them go on to our residence tester if it's good. And as you can see around this robot, there's no guarding. I can be right close to it. That's, that's what, where the collaboration comes in. You can work side by side with these things. Here's a close up on what the camera is seeing. It's seeing the part's teeth, checking all of them to make sure they are okay. Here's the other side of it. And once a part passes, this one comes on to a resonance tester. You'll see here, coming down and there's a hammer that'll come out and hit this part right there. And we actually use sound to determine if that part is cracked or not, which is a pretty cool system in my opinion. Another cool thing about programming these is you just hit a button and you can 
literally drag the robot right to where you want it to go. Makes programming on these things pretty simple. Uh, you know, very user friendly. And like I said, these are collaborative. So if they run into a human, they're designed to stop right away. As you can see right there. That's why there's no guarding around these things. It makes it simple installing. And something we also got into within the last couple of years is machining in house. We have one NRX lathe, it's a dual spindle right here. This uh, the NRX is, and then we have two single axis J1s, which you'll see later on. But uh, these are, in my opinion, one of the coolest uh, machines we have in here. They're really quick, um, do very precision work. As you can see, we're milling slots out on these parts, and they run 24 7 without really any problems. Very nice machines. And quick changeover, as you can see. I mean, the cycle times on these are, are very, very minimal for the amount of parts we do. And here are the J1s doing a similar process, just uh, one less step. We're just machining out the ID on these parts. Really quick, simple process. So 3D printing, I do a lot of printing for our place in house, actually at my house, I own 3D, three 3D printers at the moment. Uh, right here is a piece I needed the other day. Uh, this is one of our parts for a robot. I need to make an insert, right there's the insert. So I drew it up in CAD, uh, real quick, 20 minutes. I'm throwing it right here into my slicing program for my printer. And this is basically gonna show you exactly what the printer is gonna do. So there's that model that I drew. I loaded it in here. I sliced it through my slicer. And right here, as you can see, 3D printers build up layer by layer. And this is exactly what it's showing. Uh, I can change all my parameters on the right side if I needed to make it stronger, need make it weaker, save time. As you can see in the bottom right corner, this little piece is only gonna take 27 minutes to print. So I can go from drawing something 20 minutes, loading in here, printing it, and have a, a, a full working piece within an hour. If I would have to send out, out to get machine for like two or three days maybe, depending on how busy they are and, and definitely about twice as much. That part right there probably only costs 35 cents to make. And right here is actually showing you exactly what the printer head would do. This is a pretty, pretty unique software. So here's actually my printer printing, did a little time lapse of it. Uh, as you can see, just started right at the bottom, it's gonna build this up layer by layer. And this particular printer, the, the piece that it's on, that black sheet right there is even a heated bed that'll get heated up to about 100 degrees Celsius keep that uh, part on there while it's printing. And that hot end, that silver piece that it's printing out of goes to about 210 degrees Celsius to melt the filament. And like, like the slicer said, this took probably about 27 minutes to print. And the very next day I have a working piece that I can use. This is a very, very useful technology in this field. I also print a lot of CMM fixtures with this, gripper fingers, I mean, Pretty much anything, anything you can imagine. All different types of filament. This is regular PLA filament. This is actually made out of corn husks. So it's biodegradable and all that. We're getting towards the top here. Should be about done any second. And there it is, the finished finish product and the part that it needs to be on.
Uh, it turned out real good. Like I said, 27 minutes, all it took. And as you can see, it fits in there like it's designed. The accuracy on these printers are actually quite good. and get it down to within the thousands. And then for that same part, I need another fixture to pick this off of the robot. So again, I'm all of that fixture, good half hour, 20 minutes. I'm gonna throw this into our slicing software. Now this one's quite a bit bigger than the other one. So if you look on the bottom right, this one's gonna take about three hours and 51 minutes. So a little bit longer, but still, if I would have to send this out to get machined and made, the price triple and the lead time, you know, three to five days, depends how busy the shops are, all that. So again, showing you layer by layer, seeing all the infill, that, that grid pattern, you can change that if you want it. If you want this part stronger, you put more uh, infill in there and make it stronger, you want it weaker, take it out. As you can see, this is how the printer actually prints it. And here's this one printing. I gotta apologize in advance, my GoPro battery died about three quarters of the way up. So it's gonna stop three quarters of the way up before it finished. But uh, you can see this one's quite a bit bigger than the other one. Printing layer by layer, doing the same thing as the other one. And as you can see on the right, that cardboard box, 3DX tech, I use a lot of filaments from them. I get carbon fiber filled filaments if I want something really strong. Uh, great company, I think they're out in Michigan. Uh, and they're my, my go-to for these guys for uh, all different types of filaments. They even make flexible filaments. You need to have something that bends. I make some of our gantry end caps out of the stuff. It's called TPU. And it's uh, pretty much just like printing rubber. It's a pretty, pretty sweet material. Also make gaskets and stuff right out of it. So instead of uh, going out and buying gaskets, I can actually print the design right there instead of having to make them or anything else like that. Really useful technology. Now our Ridgeway plant also has a fully industrial Mark Ford 3D printer. And then our MIM place actually has a metal 3D printer doing the same thing you see right here, just out of metal, a little bit of different process. Uh, they got to debind it. And then it's called a smokeless oven that they put it through to temp and to incinerate. And here's a finished component. Like I said, I apologize. The video got cut off and my battery died on my camera, but here it is. And there's a part fits perfectly. Uh, my robot can come pick that off accurately every time. Uh, and like I said, that one apparently cost 25 cents to make maybe, something like that. Real cheap, easy, I can have stuff done in a day. So. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk more about the um, computer-aided design or CAD systems that we use and um, different things you can do with that. Um, so what you see on the screen right now is a customer print. So what will happen is when the customer wants us to make a part, they will send us a print like this. It has all of the dimensions and things that they need the part to, to be, um, whether that be how thick the part is, um, the circle on the outside of the part needs to be a certain dimension. These are all things that we can and we do control here. So this slide is going to show you that same print that you just saw, but it's modeled up in our CAD software. Now we use Solid Edge. Um, it's a 3D modeling software. So we can actually create a complete model of this part and view it in different ways to see um, how we're gonna, going to make the part and things of that nature. Now this next slide shows the tooling so like Jeff mentioned earlier, um, the powder goes into the dye, which is this piece here. And the dye gets filled and we have to create all of these models and drafts and have different places make these for us. Um, so dyes like this um, can cost, you know, four or $5,000 on at times. So these are quite expensive. Um, we like to make sure we don't break them, <laughs> but it does happen from time to time. So the next two um, images here are the top punch. So this comes down into the top of the die to keep that powder inside. Um, and then the next one is the bottom punch. So this would come from the bottom of the die to keep all of that powder and compress it. 
So I'll let this video play. As you can see, we can kind of move the models around and, and do different things with them once we do create them. So this slide is interesting. Um, sometimes we're not sure if um, a tool that we design is going to hold up. Um, when I say hold up, I do mean with how much force and pressure there is on these parts. Um, this particular part and tool that I'm showing now um, has about 50 full grown elephants of force just on the face of that part. So that's about 300 or so tons. That, that's a lot of force that these machines can produce. Um, so we need to make sure that the tools we make aren't going to blow up essentially, um, because that would be bad. So this is a bit of an exaggeration of how far this punch is moving. Now this punch is solid steel. You go to a, a car or anything, it's a little bit of a thinner steel. This is very, very thick and dense. Um, so it's deflecting 0 0.004 inches which doesn't sound like a lot, but when it's in terms of powdered metal, it's about a mile. So, so this next slide is also interesting. This is a bit of an example, um, like Jeff showed earlier of the presses, this shows it with models. So I'm gonna start these almost at the same time. You see the top punch moves into the die and that's a cross section on the right side. So you can see what's happening on the inside of this. And then uh, the part gets lifted out and it comes out of the side. Now I'm going to replay these and explain a little bit more. So the powder will come in in that gap there. The part will be created. It'll be pressed together. And just like the green part that Jeff mentioned earlier, it's pretty stable until it gets centered. And then it's very, very difficult to break. Um, a lot of engines, vehicle engines and things like that um, require parts to be very strong and hard so they don't break um, when the vehicle is running. So some of the end products uh, we create parts for, um, the Ford F-150 truck and the Jeep Grand Cherokee. So there are components in the engines of both of these vehicles um, that every one of the vehicles in the world come through Wilcox. So that's pretty cool to think about that a local place is making these parts and we're relying on the people, engineers and, and workers here to make sure that these vehicles run for a long time. Some other pieces of equipment that we make parts for, um, Briggs and Stratton engines. Um, it's a lot of lawn mowers, riding lawn mowers, and push lawn mowers, as well as household power tools, um, different saws, dremels, uh, things like that. So a lot of what we do is very detailed. I mean, it's a high degree of making sure that things don't break and hurt somebody. So going back to the CAD, um, not all of what you have to do in a CAD system revolves around work. So I know that you guys probably know what this is. For those of you that play Fortnite, this is a tier four pickaxe that actually I created. And I'm gonna play the video of it moving around. These softwares are incredible. They can do amazing things. Like I said, not just work related. So a lot of your favorite video games, a lot of the things you see out every day, were designed in a system like this first, and then adjusted and tweaked, and then programmed into a game or built um, like Jeff does 3D printing. So most of everything you see in the world at one point was designed in a program like this. Fortnite. <laughs> All right, this next slide shows an engine. Uh, this was not drawn by me, but uh, it shows a lot of the detail. Um, so those blue, blue circle parts right in the front, as well as those gold parts, are a bit of a mock-up, uh, like a really simple design of things we build here in Wilcox. So this is going to go uh, dark from time to time while the views change. So you can see all of the detail um, in, these, in this engine. And I'm going to turn some of the shrouding off, which are the protective covers, and see all of the different details that go into making an engine like this work. Now, this is a bit of a bigger engine that you would see mostly in a semi or a large construction vehicle. Um, this one's a little bigger than what would be in your parents' vehicles, but you can see the detail here. All of these parts need designed by a company and then all of them need built. It's, it's pretty incredible to think about how much detail goes into these. So what I have here, it's a, a live drawing demonstration. I'm actually gonna draw it for you right now. 
Um, so bear with me a little bit. <clears throat> About halfway through this, you guys are going to be able to guess um, what's being drawn. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, while I'm doing the drawing. So like I said, you can have fun with these programs as well. So I'm entering dimensions. <clears throat> so what these do um, is make sure your line is exactly the length and angle of what you need it. So think a little bit to um, your math classes, how you need you know, certain numbers and certain formulas to be the way that they are. It's exactly what we're doing here, and we do this every day. Maybe not drawing things for fun, but drawing things for work. <clears throat> a lot of these skills, um, some are learned in college, um, some are learned on the job. Um, Jeff is incredible with these programs as well, and he learned all on the job and on his own. Um, I learned a little bit of this in school, in college specifically, and then taught the rest of myself after the fact. So you're getting a lot of different experiences um, depending on where you work. APG is, is very good about making sure we have the right um, training and experience that we need. So right about here is when you can start getting a little bit of an idea of what I'm drawing. So entering the dimensions, in this case, it's a two inch by two inch square. And I'm making a second one as well. And you'll see just in one second, I'm dimensioning that square. So what I'm doing is saying, okay, I need this square, I need the edge of it this far away from the edge of that block that's already built. So I can tell the program, I need it, in this case, two inches away, and, it'll, and <clears throat> it will then listen to me. Anything that I tell the program to do, it will do. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. If I do something I'm not supposed to. So here in one second, you will get a very good idea of what I'm drawing. And teachers, I apologize if the kids get loud during this part. All right, so now just about everybody knows exactly what's being drawn. So what's interesting is games like this, which you now see, um, it is a Minecraft creeper, um, actually design their models and their characters in a very similar way. They don't, might not use this exact program, but everything has to be modeled and then programmed into a game so engineering around here is very specific to powdered metal, typically. Um, engineering elsewhere can do really anything. And like I said, game designs and things of that nature. It's pretty incredible what um, this program can do. So we have a slide for questions. Um, I know there's not a ton of time, but if anybody has anything, um, teachers, if there's something you would like to ask or, or Amy, um, feel free. And Jeff and I can do our best to answer. Well, I had one question, um, like thinking back to like, uh, you know, at the elementary grade level, how would, would a student, you know, kind of think that maybe they are interested in, in, in engineering? Like, what do you think, what type of, you know, what type of student would kind of, you know, be that type of, of um, career for them? So this can really vary. Um, myself, I was very into math and science. I was always very strong in those two subjects. I was good at others, but I wasn't quite interested in them. So I knew growing up, um, especially with my dad being an engineer and an uncle of mine being an engineer, that I saw firsthand um, kind of how those played into um, that job in the end. So I was able to kind of tier how I wanted to do things um, through elementary school, middle school, and high school to eventually go to engineering school. In, Jeff's going to talk a little bit more on the on the different side of this. Yeah, I, uh, basically the same thing like Bill said. I mean, if, like you focused on math and stuff like that. I mean, that's perfect for engineering. We use that every day. But like for me, I was I was a kid that kind of like to take stuff apart, see how they worked. You know, I was never never really too too 
too far into the math classes and all that, but I, I was really interested in how stuff worked and how they made it and, you know, how they had to make certain pieces the way they did to make everything work. It what interested me into, you know, pursuing, you know, a career in engineering. And like, if I go back and do this all over again, definitely, I would focus more in math class. Definitely, I use that every day in here, and Bill does the same. And uh, drawing, I mean, if, if you like drawing, even just sitting down with a piece of paper, drawing pictures and everything, I mean, that's perfect in the CAD world. Like Bill said, I never really had many CAD classes, which looking back, I really wish I did. Uh, but yeah, I mean, drawing, definitely a good good part of that too, so. so I have two quick questions and then we'll have to move on. But uh, one of the boys wants to know what happens when one of the machines at the plant breaks down. Is that your department, you know, that fixes those? Yeah, well, yeah, it's either between engineering and maintenance. And I was fortunate enough to be part of maintenance. So I think people still consider me half and half, half maintenance and half engineering department. But it depends on what kind of break it is. Like if the robots go down, uh, the main motor drives and all that stuff, that's mainly me, automation or electricians. But if, uh, you know, if uh, the bolts will break on a press on the floor and the press will move around, that'll be, that'll be maintenance mostly. But then also they come to us if they need something designed, made to help them fix stuff. If something breaks, I need a print to make it, you know, that's where our department steps in. So it's a good thing about here is we, all these different departments are actually really good at helping each other. Well, that's good. And um, um, a student wants to know, do you know if there are any free CAD programs that you know kids could kind of go out and play around with? Yes, I actually use one at my house. It's called Fusion 360 from Autodesk. As long as you are not a commercial company, it is free to go on there and download. It's uh, really a mixture of multi programs. You can do, it has CAD, 2D and 3D in it. And it also has uh, G code for like, if you're machining, you can create, you know, your machining programs and stuff. It also has simulations and everything. It is a great software. I use it at home. And again, it's Fusion 360 by Autodesk. I do want to jump in real quick on that as well. Um, a lot of computers have a harder time handling that detail of the software. Um, this is going to sound weird, but Minecraft is an excellent way for a student to get started to get interested in engineering, um, building things in that, understanding how things work. Um, you play, um, they all understand redstone. Um, that's a good way to see how circuits and electricity works as well. All right. Well, that's great advice. Um, so students, if you're Think you're interested um, there's a couple of programs that you can go out and give it a shot all right well uh, we're gonna have to move on but i'd like to thank you guys for joining us today and sharing um what you do as engineers yep you're very welcome and thank you for having both of us yes thank you very much so now we're gonna uh, move on to uh, natalie alio she's from the penn state extension for h and she's going to uh, work through an activity with you guys. So welcome, Natalie. Thank you, Amy, for the wonderful introduction. And welcome, everybody. It's so nice to be with you guys on a nice Friday afternoon. The best way to end the week, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of excited. I know if any of my kiddos were in this class, they'd be really, really happy that somebody is encouraging them to play Minecraft. So use... Do you need an excuse to go home and play some video games on a rainy day? That sounds like the perfect one. Okay, so we have, um, can everybody see my, can see my screen? Activity that we're going to do today. And your teachers, if the teachers um, aren't ready for this yet, we'll get ready for it. But we're going to talk about um, how we can think like an engineer. So we're going to talk a little bit about technology because part of the way of getting to think like an engineer is actually experiencing how they can work through some problem solving things. So to get started with this activity, classrooms are broken into small groups. Raise your hand if you are in, if your teacher has broken you into small groups already. Okay, perfect. 
So each of these groups is going to be given a very simple engineered technology. So when we think of technology, we think of something that kind of improves how we live our lives. And a lot of times it's engineers that help develop these technologies and technologies normally solve some sort of prob problems, okay? So within your group, there's going to be one of four different technologies that you're going to receive. You will either receive a Band-Aid, a Ziploc bag, a toothpaste pump, or what was it? Oh, a pop-top can. <laughs> So you're going to receive one of those four things, and all of those things have really helped um, make life a little bit easier for all of us. So when you work through the questions that we're going to see on the next screen within your group, I want you to stop and think about maybe what people did before this technology was developed and how it could have improved their life. So you're in your group going to need a piece of paper. And the questions that you're going to answer about your technology is what is it? What problem does or do the engineering technology solve? So it might be a problem, it might be multiple problems. When you think of a band aid, why would a band aid be developed? Why would a pop top can be developed? What problem did those technologies solve? And finally, how did that technology improve our lives? So that's what you guys are going to work on. So teachers, if you can make sure the students are broken up into groups, give each group their small technology, either the plastic bag, the pop top can, the um, Band-Aid or the toothpaste pump, we're gonna give you guys about five minutes to answer these questions and see what you can, um, see what you can come up with. Okay. And while you guys are working on this, right now I have it's two, oh, it's about 2.15. I'm going to give you guys till 2.20. And then we're going to take a look at some of these technologies and see how they were developed, maybe when they were developed and who developed them and how they have improved people's lives. So go ahead, take a few minutes. If you have any questions, you can um, either use the chat pod or you can, um, teachers, they can come up to the microphone and unmute themselves and ask their questions.
You have about three more minutes. So see if you can finish up with your question or the answers to these questions on the screen. And then we're gonna go through them and, and see how well you were able to think like an engineer. All right, one more minute, kiddos. So finish up, finish up answering your questions. And teachers, due to time constraints, we probably won't be able to take a lot of answers from our students, but this might give you guys an opportunity to allow your students to think, pair, share with other groups um, if they're able to do that, share their personal ideas. We're going to kind of generally cover some of the big ideas, but I'm sure that they have all come up with some awesome ideas that maybe we didn't think about. So sharing within your classroom for these four different technologies would be a really awesome idea. All right, it is 20 after, so let's get started. If you guys could return to your seats and bring your focus back to our presentation, even if you didn't get all the answers, um, all the questions answered, that's okay. Again, you guys can share with your friends later. Um, if there's something that we don't cover that you thought of, please share it with your teacher because sharing your ideas is a very, very important part of being an engineer. Also, teamwork in a group, is a very important part also. And I'm sure um, our friends uh, that did our presentation today would agree that most of the time when you're doing engineering, you are working with a team and you're rarely working by yourself. All right, raise your hand if you had the Band-Aid. How exciting. So nobody thinks that something so easy, so little can be a technology, but it actually is. So when we think about the Band-Aid, it was actually developed by Johnson & Johnson, and it was invented by Earl Dickinson in 1921, and he was actually a cotton farmer. So part of the problems that were solved with a Band-Aid, which is kind of exciting, the adhesive tape was part of the bandage and it actually stayed on elbows and knees better. So if we think of the alternative, if you've ever had to have a gauze, a piece of gauze in medical tape, sometimes it doesn't stick as well, but band-aids are really easy because the adhesive is already there. Another thing is that they can be made in a variety of different shapes and sizes. So maybe you've seen the circle band-aids before. Maybe you've seen the real, really big ones that can cover those really big cuts or maybe you've seen the really, really small ones that you can wrap around your pinky. So the variety of shapes and sizes makes it very nice for just about any kind of cut or scrape that you could get. Also, they're very easy to put on. We learn at a very young age, because our parents probably get tired of putting the Band-Aids on us anyway, that children can do it themselves. So they're very easy to open. They're very easy to apply themselves. And the, one of the best, most important things is that they are packaged separately. So each of them is sterile before you put it on. When you think about how you have to unwrap a Band-Aid and then you have to pull both sides off to make sure it's sticky, that keeps that sterile <laughs> or other things growing on it. Awesome. So 
I'm sure that you guys had a ton of different ideas uh, um, that we didn't mention. And if you did, please be prepared to share them with your teacher and your classroom. And if there's some really cool ideas, tell your teachers that Amy and I would love to hear them also. So let's move on to the next one. The toothpaste pump. Now, I don't think that you guys had a minion toothpaste pump, but um, I think you guys just had a little pump. And when we think about toothpaste, there's actually a pretty long history um, of toothpaste. So the pump, the actual pump, was developed in Germany in 1984, but it was marketed in the United States first because they figured that United States, people in the United States might be interested in something of this. When we think about toothpaste though, the idea of actually putting something on our teeth to brush them and clean them was developed by the Egyptians around 500 BC. And when they were doing it, they were using things like eggshells, pumice, which is kind of a hard rock, bark, charcoal, different things like that to actually scrub their teeth. But guess what? That stuff probably tasted disgusting. So engineers along the way realized that if we want people to brush our teeth, we're not gonna stick charcoal in our mouths and we don't wanna chew on eggshells. So Colgate, developed the first actual toothpaste in 1873. It was developed and put in a jar. So what that means is that everybody in your family would take their toothbrush and dip it in that jar and then brush their teeth. And so you can see how maybe that gets a little gross if you didn't have your own jar of toothpaste, right? Probably don't want your brother or your sisters or even your mom or your dad's toothpaste dipped in that jar before you have to use it, right? So some of the problems that were solved by the development of toothpaste in general, and then specifically the pump, was that when fluoride was added to toothpaste, when toothpaste was developed and they could add certain things to it, it really helped to prevent tooth decay. If you ever went to the dentist and they rubbed that fluoride treatment on your teeth, and sometimes it tastes a little gritty, that's actually really important for your teeth. Um, modern toothpaste also tastes a lot better and it's a lot easier to use. And then when the pump was when the pump was created, the dispenser reduces the amount of toothpaste that is wasted. So raise your hand if you have a tube of toothpaste in your bathroom that gets really gross and maybe there's chunks of toothpaste all over your uh, all over your bathroom sink because the because the actual tubes are kind of hard to keep the toothpaste in. When you use the pump, you push the, dot, the top part down, a little bit goes onto your toothbrush, and then there's a little bit, there's less waste, okay? So those are some of the problems that were solved by putting toothpaste in a pump and even developing toothpaste generally. Let's take a look at our Ziploc bags. How many of you got the Ziploc bag? Raise your hands. How many of you actually, when it was handed to you, thought this isn't technology? Even if you compare it to a regular sandwich bag that doesn't seal, I'm sure you'll realize that packing your lunch and putting things in a Ziploc bag is a lot more effective than putting your Cheetos in a sandwich bag and then finding them all over your lunchbox when you finally open your lunch bag. Huh? So the first Ziploc bag was launched by Dow Chemical in 1968. So when we say the first Ziploc bag, that is the first Ziploc brand bag. There was another company that created a bag that sealed, but the Ziploc brand bag is this one. Now we, we call any bag that seals anymore a Ziploc bag, but it's actually, Ziploc is actually the brand name. So the problems that we solved with these sealable bags, specifically in this case, the Ziploc bag, is that it's a bag that we can open and reseal time after time. So you can store things in this bag and you can take what you need out and then you can seal the rest of it in there. So not only does stuff not fall out, but if you look down at point three, food items can remain fresh because the bag can be resealed. So if you think about putting your sandwich inside a Ziploc bag, by the time you get to lunch, your bread is normally still soft. Um, these plastic bags that are Ziploc bags can also hold items without anything escaping the bag. So if you ever put a bag of crayons in your book bag and it was a Ziploc bag, 
you know that those ba that bag of crayons, those crayons aren't going to be spilled all over your bag. But if it's not a Ziploc bag, there's a chance that those things will get spilled inside your bag. And the other nice thing about a Ziploc bag is it's not only for food items and it's not only for solid items, but you could put powders, liquids, or solids in those bags also. And if you've ever done any of my science programs and we've made slime, we've put a lot of slime in Ziploc bags. And as long as it's sealed, that slime stays good and doesn't get all over your book bag. So that is our Ziploc bag. And then our final item, raise your hand if you got the pop top for your can and you probably just got the little, the little tab here. Awesome. That's a really important piece of technology too. Sometimes we don't think it's technology if we have seen it um, and we are very familiar with it and we weren't alive when it was invented. But if, if we were um, alive previous to the invention of it, it would probably be a really cool thing because it really gives us a lot of different opportunities. So the pop top can was actually developed in 1959 by a man named Ermel Fraz. And the tab on this, the pull top can, allowed for drinks to be opened anytime, anywhere. So if you think previous to this, if a drink was sealed, maybe you needed a special can over to be able to drink it. But now we have a pop top can that would allow it to open anytime, anywhere. Originally, the tabs that he created were a litter problem in the US and a safety concern because originally those tabs, you'd pull it off the can and then people would throw it on the ground or some people would put it in their mouths and try and eat it and it would get stuck in their esophagus and, and cause um, safety concerns if they tried to swallow it. So it wasn't until 1977 that they improved the tab to push in and then fold that tab back to make it stay as part of the can. So we can still remove those tabs, but for the most part, you have to work a little bit to remove them and they, they stay part of the can. And this ensures that it stays on the can and that you're not swallowing it and that you're not throwing it on the ground. So that was even an improvement that was about 20 years after the original can was developed. And the problems that were solved with the pop top can were that they could be opened anywhere and it made traveling with food or drinks a lot more easy. And it also, um, later improvements remedied the litter problem and prevented injury. So those were our four simple technologies that we had a chance to look at. If you go through your kitchens or through your houses, I'm sure over this weekend, you could find a lot of different technologies um, that have really made our lives a lot easier. And it's engineers that help to not only think of these technology, but also develop these technologies um, in order to improve our quality of life. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Amy so she can do some closing remarks, but I wanna thank you guys all for attending. It was so nice to be part of this presentation today. Amy, you're muted. Well, thanks, Natalie, for uh, doing the activity and helping students think like an engineer. Um, our time flew right by, and um, unfortunately, it's time for us to go. But I hope that you enjoyed the presentation from uh, Alpha Precision Group and that you have a better idea of what an actual engineer does. And I hope that you'll um, use their uh, suggestions of the uh, software and go on and try doing some CAD drawing yourself. All right, so thank you for joining us and we hope you have a good a good afternoon. Bye. All right, go. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, move your desk now. Yes, move your desk now.
Bye. 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 Amy, should we stop the recording while everybody's leaving?